Hello and welcome to another episode of Jesus Doctrine. Today I want to talk to you about the idea of the double portion. Throughout the Bible we constantly read about people that are offered a double portion. And so for example the firstborn child in the scripture is often given a double portion. The firstborn child in addition to the double portion also has the right to take over the leadership of the family after the father in that family has passed away. And this is part of the rights of the firstborn and the double portions included in this. We also find in 1 Samuel chapter 5 that Hannah, while she's barren and she cannot conceive a child, she's offered a double portion of love from her husband because she's barren. Obviously, we also see in the story of Elisha and Elijah that Elisha asks for a double portion of the spirit of Elisha. And this is just another case where we see a double portion being mentioned in the scripture. And finally, it's probably not the last example of a double portion in the scripture, but it's one that I'm going to mention. In the New Testament, in the book of Timothy, we read about the men that that labour in the word of God being worthy of double honour or of a double portion. So while this probably isn't the only account of a double portion in scripture, I want to use the accounts I've mentioned above to begin to describe a complete picture of a double portion in scripture and how they're all interrelated and connected. So to begin, I want us to start off by looking at the story of Elisha and Elisha, because we know that there's a very clear example of Elisha asking for a double portion. And the scripture reads as follows. Elijah said to Elisha, What shall I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked for a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken away from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. What's interesting was there was a condition for this double portion and he always relied upon Elisha being faithful to his master Elijah and through the process of seeing him when he's taken away, when he's taken up by the chariots of fire into the heavens or into the sky, Elijah had to be there to be a witness, which means he had to devote himself to serving and being by the side of Elijah. Now, Elijah was fortunate and he was there. And there is a reason that I'm deliberately using this passage as I speak about the double portion. And it's because Elijah and Elijah aren't just two prophets that are linked together because one trained up the other. There is a picture and a parallel that's being used through both of these prophets to reveal the life of Jesus that I think is very important in our understanding of what it means to receive a double portion. Very commonly, people think the idea of Elijah and Elijah is about receiving a double blessing. So you receive twice as much of the increase that you're looking for, whether it be children, wealth, property, whatever it would be, miraculous power, supernatural power, anointing. People have all these ideas about the double portion. Some people think that the double portion is just a matter of being a part of Elijah's ministry as his disciple and then taking on the mantle and becoming a prophet in his place. And then you've got others that just make it about the anointing and the gifting and the power that Elijah is able to function in. Interestingly enough, understanding the life of Elijah and Elijah is important to understanding what it means to receive a double portion. Elijah times two does not equal Elijah. Even though you would assume that's what a double portion means, Elijah and Elijah's ministry are completely different. Elijah was a prophet that always brought judgment. Whereas Elijah's ministry was often one of mercy and grace. Let's have a look at this together. So Elijah comes up to a widow who's about to eat the last bit of her food with her son. And then she's about to die in a time of famine. And Elijah comes and he demands food from her. It seems a bit harsh, but through it, this widow is blessed and her son. And they are actually able to to live because God fulfills their need for food. We read about Elijah praying and he shuts up the heavens and there's a drought. And as a result of this drought, people in the land are now without the ability to grow food that crops. There's not a supply of water and it's a judgment that's really fallen upon the land. Elijah's own words here seem very heavy. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years except by my word. Elijah is clearly the one that's bringing this judgment to the land. 
Elijah also in the scriptures calls down fire from heaven to consume up his sacrifice and to prove that the true living God, the God of Israel is the true God and that Baal and his false prophets are false gods. And so God is using Elijah to make a judgment between the false gods and the true God of Israel. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, let not one escape them. And they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Akishwan and slaughtered them there. We read constantly about Elijah performing great signs and wonders and killing people and bringing judgment. He's asking for the food of this widow. And as a result of that, she, he then provides for her needs. But it was a form of judgment. If she hadn't trusted him, she would have died. But because she trusted him, she was allowed to live with her son. We also read about how Elijah calls down fire from heaven on two more occasions to kill a number of soldiers that are sent to seek out this man of God, Elijah. And he uses, he uses words like this. If I am a man of God, let fire come from heaven and consume you. And he does this twice and he goes to do it a third time until God has to intervene and say, Elijah, enough's enough. Just go with the people. And the reason I'm pointing all this out is because constantly through Elijah's ministry, we see him acting as a judge to sinful people, to sinful nations, or even to a sinful Israel. We also find that Elijah is a very lonely and mysterious character. And on a number of occasions in his life, Elijah was simply just disappears. And this is, seems to be something that constantly follows Elijah, that he just vanishes from sight. For example, in the following scripture, it says, as the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath from the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And so we read about how everywhere that Elijah's gone, everywhere that this king and his servants have gone, People have been seeking after the presence of Elijah and no one seems to be able to find him. It's not just when he's taken up in a chariot of fire that Elijah disappears. But there have been other times in his life that Elijah the prophet has magically vanished, which is probably why the school of the prophets go out looking for Elijah when he's taken up high. Because people are so used to Elijah doing similar things and God moving him from place to place and taking him to a place of obscurity and hiding. But we shouldn't be surprised to find that Elijah is a lonely character in the scripture. It's not easy to make friends when you're constantly judging, bringing droughts, bringing down fire, killing false gods and the gods that people worship, bringing judgment upon people, demanding the food and the last bit of food that you've got. Elijah was a, while he was a true prophet that had the power and the signs and wonders of God, he constantly brought judgment to the land. He shut up the heavens from rain for three and a half years. That's not going to make you too many friends. And this was kind of the dilemma of Elijah. He was called to a ministry of strict judgment of people. And as a result of it, we read it from Elijah's own words that he feels that he is on his own. Let's have a read of what he constantly says throughout the book of Kings. I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the swords. And I only, even I am left and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah constantly thinks that he's the only person alive that's doing the work of God. Despite on occasion people telling him that there have been other prophets that have been kept alive and hidden in caves. Elijah is a lone ranger that brings the judgment of God that functions as an individual on his own to do the work of God. Oftentimes, Elijah seems harsh and he seems like he's merciless, but this is just because of the ministry that God has given to him. But on the flip side, we read a completely different story when we begin to look at Elijah the prophet. Now, we know that Elijah received a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. So let's have a think about what this means. It means that Elijah did do twice as many miracles as Elijah in the scriptures. Strangely enough, we don't read about people loving Elijah in the same way that we read about the way that the children of Israel loved Elijah and all that he did. 
Elijah, like I said earlier, his ministry was far more graceful. It was far more forgiving and restorative. So let's have a look at this. The first thing that we read about him doing is that he begins to part the waters in exactly the same way that Elijah parted the waters and travelled through the water on a dry seabed or riverbed, I should say. The next one that we read about is the way that he begins to heal the bad waters and he he starts to also restore food where there's poison in the pot and he makes it so the people could eat it. He takes away the pain and the suffering and the barrenness and the miscarriage that's going on on the land. And he's able to bring healing onto the land without bringing rain. He's able to make a stream of water begin to flow without rain ever falling through the power of God. Elisha is a prophet that brings restoration that brings hope and that brings redemption to people. It's very different from the kind of man that Elijah was that would have brought judgment and death. For example, listen to some of the words that Elijah spoke. You shall not see rain or wind, but the stream bed shall be filled with water. You shall drink and your livestock and your animals. And if that wasn't good enough to give you an encouragement that Elijah has a ministry of hope, listen to this. But while they were eating their stew, they cried out, O oh man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat it. He said, bring the flour, and he threw the flour in the pot. And then he said, pour out some for the men that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. Now what had gone into that pot previously would have been poisonous. But here we see this man of God has made it edible for these people to eat. Elijah also, he cleansed the leper, Naaman the leper comes to him and he asks him to, he commands that he dips in the river Jordan seven times. And when he does this, he finds restoration of his skin. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. Why? Because he's not here to judge and condemn, but he's here to show the people that God will accept them and heal them of their sins, heal them of their sickness. Make them from being unclean people to clean before the eyes of God, cleansed by God's own means, the living waters of life. We even read about a time where Elijah was completely surrounded. And what does Elijah do? Does he begin to fear for the armies of the enemy have come and encamped around him? Him and the school of prophets are there. He's noticed that he's not alone. Elijah was always alone everywhere he went, but not Elijah. Elijah went around with the school of prophets. He went around with Gehazi, his servant. And at the time where there's a whole army around him, Elijah prays and he opens the eyes of the people around him. And he begins to reveal that protecting them is an army of the hosts of heaven with chariots of fire. And all of a sudden people could see that they were never going to be alone in life in the same way that Jesus never leaves us alone in life. He sends us angels to be with us and to guard over us. And he also has his presence always with us wherever we go. He will never leave us or forsake us. There's some other interesting things that Elijah does that really do draw us parallels to what Jesus does. Like I've said, he uses the waters and the living waters to cleanse us, to redeem us and to restore us in the same way that Jesus does. He takes us through the waters of life, through the baptism through the first steps that begin our journey oftentimes as we become new believers and we confess our faith and we go through the water. He continues this journey of restoration and he begins to feed us miraculously. He begins to provide for us. He's able to turn bad and waters of death that are bitter or that are harmful to us into our prosperity, enabling us to prosper. He goes even further and he begins to come to those children, come to those people that are dead in the world and to give us the words to be able to speak life into them. And this is exactly what happens to Elijah. Elijah finds that he has the power to raise the dead, but far more than just raising the dead while he's alive. Even once Elijah dies and his dead bones are buried and they go to the grave, even after Elijah's death, his bones are able to raise the dead in the same way that even after Jesus died, he still has the power to raise us again from the dead. Elijah is a type of Christ and we see very strong parallels between the life of Elijah and the life of Jesus. And we see it particularly strong when we look at the compassion and the love and the mercy that Jesus offers. And it's similar to the life, the love and the mercy 
that Elijah has to offer. What's interesting was that Elijah never raises any man from the dead after he dies. And let me explain why Elijah was unable to do this. Elijah's ministry was one of judgment and one of the law. And the law stops at the point that you die. The second you die, you cannot be sentenced guilty of murder anymore because death has ended that. The second you die, you are no longer married because your partner, you are deceased. Therefore, your partner is now single and free to go on and to marry again. And this was the ministry of Elijah. It was judgmental. It was strict and it was hard, but it stopped and it ended at the point of death. But the ministry of Elijah the miracle, the miraculous power of mercy and grace went on forever and ever because even after death, God's mercy and grace can continue. The life of Jesus Christ continues. The resurrection power will continue well beyond the grave because it's the life that we live in Christ. Let me put it this way. You want to understand the double portion better. The double portion is best understood as this. If somebody gets justice, one person's probably going to be punished and another person is probably going to find that they've been avenged for the actions that have happened in their life. But it's not so when you have a double portion. When you have a double portion, both people walk away blessed. The one that gives mercy and the one that receives mercy, both people are able to be blessed by a double portion. Elijah's ministry was not a double portion in the sense that there were double the amount of miracles or two times what Elijah did. Elijah's ministry was a double portion because it blessed both him and those who he ministered to. And as a result of it, his ministry was a blessing to everybody. In the same way that when we have double portions in the Bible, if you're the firstborn child and you receive a double portion, you are going to serve your father But equally, after you've served your father and you have been personally blessed, you are also going to serve your family as the leader and you are going to be a blessing to them. You're given a double portion because you were not just being blessed yourself, but because you're going to pour out blessing upon somebody else. And this was the way that the double portion was used in scripture. Hannah received a double portion. Why? Because she was barren. And so her husband chose to love her more because of the hardship and the place that she'd been in. He showed her mercy and compassion that perhaps she did not deserve because it was what was required of love. And this is how God shows us a double portion. He gives us good while we deserve to be treated badly and we deserve judgment. And this is what it means. Jesus Christ and his second coming is going to come to bring judgment. But thank God that on his first coming, he came with a double portion and he was able to show us the way of mercy and grace. Elijah came to judge the world and Elijah came to save it. And I want to remind you that we have a ministry of showing people love, mercy and compassion. We're called to live above, to live in this life and to live in the life to come. We're called to have a double portion. We're called to see the goodness of God in the land of the living and in the kingdom of God that will one day be established. We have a double portion. It's not just about the spiritual giftings, but I promise you this, that when we walk with God, there is so much more blessing than what this life has to offer. There is so much more blessing than what justice has to offer. When you have the ability to forgive, you are empowered to find the blessing of God and to bless others whilst you carry on that same journey in your walk of life. There's one final thing that I want to mention, and it's at Gehazi. Jesus was betrayed by Judas of Iscariot for 30 pieces of silver. And in the same way, Gehazi betrayed Elijah for what? A bit of money and a change of clothes. It's interesting that those that give mercy oftentimes might find that there are people in life that would turn away from them for their own personal gain. But you know what? It's not the end of the story. Because the man of God still went on to do great things and to inspire generations to come. We can't be afraid of being hurt when we show mercy. And it's what Jesus shows us. It's what Elijah shows us. That just because people have done wrong and gone after their own devices and sought after their own greed and material gain. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to show love, compassion and mercy. So please do like, comment and subscribe to my channel. Jesus Doctrine. When you subscribe, do click on the little bell notification so you get all the notifications of all the new content and all the new videos that I'm making. I hope this helps you to better understand Elijah, 
Elisha and the idea of a double portion and why it's so important to us as believers. I'm starting to realise now that many of the kings and the prophets, a lot of them are interconnected and they're best studied in pairs sometimes. And I'm starting to really enjoy reading the Old Testament and seeing all these New Testament concepts unfold and the blessing of God hidden in his word. So please do read along, watch with me, like, comment and subscribe. Thank you for watching.